The following five lectures will be devoted to microbial energetics, the metabolic capability of microorganisms. Why are we spending so much time on this topic? Because these capabilities are one of the major ways that microorganisms impact their environment. Their activity literally has a global impact on the earth. Here are the learning outcomes if you're interested in them. The first important idea in metabolism is that it defines microorganisms. Morphologically, while there are differences, it is their metabolism that makes them unique from one another. In other words, microbial diversity equals metabolic diversity. Microbes as a group are capable of using many reactions to generate energy. And it is not an overstatement to say that if there is a reaction that can generate energy, there is a microbe capable of using it. Do you need a refresher in chemistry? Follow that link. Otherwise, let's look at some examples. By now you are familiar with the microbes that use organic compounds, as we do. However, microbes can go far beyond the capability of mere eukaryotes. For example, some microbes can grow on compounds that we consider dangerous, such as atrazine, a potentially toxic herbicide and pollutant of groundwater. One very effective microbe at degrading it is Rhodococcus, shown on the left. On the right, you can see its complex degradation pathway. There are even microbes that can grow on metals. One example is the iron magnesium oxidizing bacteria. These microbes grow on iron 2 plus, oxidizing it to iron 3 plus, which is highly insoluble. They get their carbon from carbon dioxide, just like plants do. If you ever go to a bog or swamp and you look at the water, it will be a rust colored. This rust color is iron hydroxide, an insoluble precipitant that accumulates because of the activity of iron bacteria. As a final example, methanogens take carbon dioxide and hydrogen and generate energy by creating methane. They are the only group of living organisms that produce a hydrocarbon as an end product. In these lectures, we will talk about common parts of metabolism that many microbes share. We will then explore a few of the unique types of microbial metabolism. We don't have time for a comprehensive treatise, but I hope to give you a foundation in metabolism that you can use if you want to explore. Before we dive into the details about fermentation, respiration, and photosynthesis, I want to spend some time laying down a foundation of understanding. There are universal concepts, common chemicals, and similar strategies used in all of metabolism. Understanding these foundational principles makes it much easier to make sense of the specifics. So let's begin with some definitions. Metabolism is the sum total of all reactions which occur in a cell. It consists of two types of processes, catabolism and anabolism. Catabolism is the use of chemical reactions to generate energy and reducing power, which is basically high energy electrons. And this drives cellular functions. These reactions can involve the breakdown of complex small molecules into smaller ones, but there are many exceptions where this doesn't occur, but it still generates energy. And finally, anabolism. Anabolism is the synthesis of needed cellular structures from similar compounds. This requires energy and often reducing power. We're gonna spend a lot of our time talking about catabolism because this is where microorganisms really differentiate themselves from eukaryotic organisms. Anabolism is nearly universal in the biological kingdom. All organisms seem to synthesize things in similar ways. So we won't spend as much time with, on that and you'll learn much more about that in your biochemistry class.
Okay, first concept. One of the requirements of metabolism is energy. This generation of energy follows a similar pattern in all living things. First, the energy comes in the form of reduced chemicals or light, one or the other. Then, through a series of biological reactions, the captured energy is used to create reduced electron carriers, such as NADH, and chemical bond energy in the form of ATP. Finally, after the cell has extracted its energy, it will dump leftover electrons into an electron acceptor to form the final reduced product. This is true for all biological systems. Second concept, Gibbs free energy. All reactions, including biological reactions, are covered by thermodynamic principles. Yep, I'm bringing physics into this. These reactions must satisfy this equation. Delta H equals delta G plus T delta S, where H is the total energy of a reaction, S is the amount of energy that is lost to entropy and is not available to do work, and G is the amount of free energy available to do work. Knowing the delta G of reaction makes it possible to predict its favorability and helps us predict what reactions can actually be used to generate energy. We want to know how much work a chemical reaction has available, so let's rearrange the equation. This informs us whether the cell can use it to drive metabolism. Since we are interested in determining delta G, let's solve for delta G. In other words, delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. The point I want to, you to get from this is that increasing entropy produces a favorable or negative delta G. Decreasing entropy or disorder, basically in the cell building something, costs free energy. So if you're fundamentally taking things apart, that often will generate energy. But if you're building cells and increasing the order in the universe, that costs free energy. Third concept, equilibrium is important. Another principle for chemical reactions is equilibrium. Imagine a chemical reaction. Let's say the combination of carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and coenzyme A to form acetyl coenzyme A. This process is carried out by acetogens. The equilibrium constant KEQ of this reaction can be represented as shown above. From this, you can calculate the free energy of the reaction. And you'll see this in this equation. So why did I bring up potentially unpleasant memories from chemistry class? I bring this up because it's important for biology. What happens if you increase the concentration of coenzyme A, carbon monoxide, or hydrogen? Right? Well, let's look at the equation. Here's the equation down here for K equilibrium. K equilibrium becomes smaller because these three compounds are in the denominator. And then if you look at the calculation for delta G, the natural log of K equilibrium, if it gets below 1, is going to be negative. That means it's going to make delta G more negative. Remember, a more negative delta G is more favorable. Therefore, delta G will go more negative and maybe even the, it will become favorable, depending on delta G naught and if you overwhelm it. Then, if you look at the products of a reaction, it is the reverse. What happens if you increase acetyl-CoA in this reaction? What happens if you increase, what happens if you decrease acetyl-CoA, right? Increasing the concentrations of products increases K equilibrium. That makes it much more than one, or makes it more than one. That will make delta G more positive and less favorable. Decreasing products 
makes a reaction more favorable. To make this all make more sense, let's look at an animation. Okay, so here we have this reaction. And let's put these all at 25. And the C iron SP with methyl group is going to stand in for our hydrogen. And because I'm modeling after this a real reaction, after the a real reaction, and then we're going to start this with no enzymes. And you can actually see the count of acetyl CoA. And you can see when it's at a very low concentration, right? Nothing happens at this lower concentration. And this is a good way to think of this mentally is these chemical compounds when they react have to encounter each other and then they have to bump into each other in just the right way to react. And in this case, that's just not happening. Okay, that's fine. So let's now increase the concentration and see what happens. So we'll jack these all up to 100 and we'll start again. Now we have much more and you're not now starting to see reactions. There's enough of them banging into each other in the right way that you get acetyl-CoA formed. And hopefully that gives you an intuition about this process. The take home message is this, high substrate concentrations increase the rate of the forward reaction. Having low concentrations of products or removing the products increases the rate of the reaction forward. Cells take advantage of this all the time and I will point out examples as we go through metabolism. They will take away products or they will increase the local concentration of substrates to drive a desired reaction. Our next point focuses on enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. All reactions have an activation energy. This is the energy required to destabilize substrates and bring them together in just the right way to form a reaction intermediate. Note that activation energy is separate from free energy of a reaction delta G. What enzymes do is lower that activation energy by bringing substrates together at the active site of the enzyme. This increases the local concentration of substrates, making reaction more likely. Enzymes also bend substrates to resemble the reaction intermediate, which favors the formation of product. Let's go back to that animation and now add an enzyme. All right, so here's our animation again. We're gonna actually leave the concentrations about half of what they were before. And I want you to watch about how rapidly you get product now. So we'll move it here, start with enzyme, and now watch that. You can see that you're very quickly forming product and product is forming faster than it was before. And you can see the enzymes in there, things getting charged on the enzyme and then reacting. Okay, so that's what enzymes really do in biological systems. And then we've already gotten 33 out of a possible 50 acetyl-CoA is made in just that little bit of time. Our fourth point is that chemical energy is the potential energy of electrons. Let's use the analogy of a waterfall. Molecules of water at the top of the waterfall have potential energy. When they fall down the falls, they gain kinetic energy that can do work. When the water molecules hit the bottom of the falls, some energy is converted into mechanical energy, throwing droplets into the air, heat, and sound. If we put a water wheel in this waterfall, we can capture some of that kinetic energy and have it do work. Chemicals can be thought of in a similar way. 
Remember that electrons are present in orbitals moving around their nucleus. Those in higher orbitals have potential energy. They can drop down to lower orbitals and in the process release energy. The cell captures some of this energy just like in the above example where we captured the waterfall's energy with a water wheel. This change in orbitals can also release other forms of energy such as heat or light. This capture often occurs as metabolic reactions cause the transfer of electrons from one molecule to another. These are called redox reactions. They're really important in biology. I think that lots of students have trouble with these, so we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about them. Chemical energy metabolism involves oxidation reduction, or what I will call redox reactions. Every atom in every molecule has electrons in it. Depending on the nature of the atoms and molecules, they will have a tendency to want to donate or accept electrons. Every redox reaction has a donor, in this case A, that gets oxidized, and an acceptor, B, that gets reduced. Electrons move from the donor to the recipient. Let's look at a real example. And in this case, we're going to use the burning of methane. In this reaction, methane is the electron donor, and in this case, an energy source. It donates its electrons to oxygen, creating carbon dioxide and water. This also releases heat, and we use that heat to heat our homes. Note that what changes is how closely the molecules hold the electrons. Hydrogen does not hold on to electrons well. Carbon is in the middle, and oxygen holds them closely. What this means is oxygen is electronegative. It likes to hold on to those electrons. You can see that the electrons move from being held by carbon and hydrogen to being held closely by oxygen. They move from a state of higher potential energy in methane to a state of lower potential energy in carbon dioxide and water. Electron transfers are sometimes associated with the release of potential energy, and this can be captured by the cell as ATP, an energy carrier. Chemicals vary in their tendency to donate or accept electrons. For example, A being reduced can be expressed as a half reaction. A oxidized plus electron goes to A reduced. However, in this case, we reverse the reaction because A is being oxidized. B can also be expressed as a half reaction. B oxidized plus the electron goes to B reduced. We can measure these half reactions against the standard electrode <coughs> and from this calculate the reduction potential for each pair. So let's dig into what a reduction potential is. Here are examples of common redox reactions in the cell and their reduction potentials. By convention, a redox half reaction is written as a reduction. For example, the reduction of FAD to FADH. This is typically measured against the standard electrode reaction which is given the value zero. All other reactions are measured against this standard. If they donate electrons to this standard, they are given a negative value. If they accept electrons from this standard, they are given a positive value. What is important is their relative potential. Half reactions that are at the top of this table are good electron donors and will donate electrons to things below them in the table. Those at the bottom of the table are good electron acceptors and will accept electrons from anything above them in the table. In an energy yielding redox reaction, compound A has a more negative reduction potential and donates electrons to compound B. The transfer releases energy, and this energy can be captured by the cell, typically in the form of ATP or reducing power. And reducing power is electrons on energy carriers.
Let's expand on that a little bit. These transfers of electrons that generate energy are often not direct, but go through carriers. Electron carriers can be proteins, such as cytochromes or flavor proteins, or small molecules, such as NADH, FADH, or quinones. In this example shown here, NAD is reduced by A to NADH, and then is oxidized by B back to NAD+. At the lower right is the complete structure of NAD, and you can see it's quite complicated, but the important thing is what's happening in that six-membered ring. NADH is a very common electron shuttle used in the cell. Note the changes to the six-membered ring showing where the hydrogen's electrons attach to NAD. In the cell, these redox reactions involve enzymes. This figure helps visualize the process. NAD plus is used to shuttle electrons from one enzymatic reaction to another. In reaction one, NAD binds and is reduced by an electron donor on enzyme one. The reduced NADH then binds to enzyme two, which catalyzes the reduction of the electron sector and regenerates the NAD plus. The take home message is that energy storage systems capture energy from reactions either as chemical bond or as an ion motive force. This stored energy is then released by the cell later to perform needed functions. So how is that energy stored in chemical bonds? Some chemicals in the cells function to store chemical bond energy, and one of the most common is adenosine triphosphate. ATP stores this chemical energy. The phosphate chemical bond is high energy and the cell links its hydrolysis to reactions to help drive them. We will go through numerous examples in the next few lectures. However, ATP is not the only way to store chemical energy. For example, the cell also stores energy in phospholinopyruvate, coenzyme A, and glucose 6-phosphate. This finishes our introduction to some fundamental topics in metabolism. The take-home messages from this first part are the following. Free energy can be manipulated. High concentrations of substrates and low concentrations of products drive a reaction forward. The cell can encourage a reaction by removing product and supplying substrate. Enzymes drive reactions by binding substrates as reaction intermediates and increasing local concentrations. This decreases the activation energy of reactions and this is the way enzymes have their catalytic capability. Redox reactions occur all the time in the cell and involve the transfer of electrons and hydrogen atoms. This often involves the use of electron carriers. Finally, chemical energy is often stored as phosphate bonds. Having a strong foundation in the fundamentals of metabolism will make these next parts that much easier to understand. Our next lecture begins the journey into the details by examining the amazing fermentations that microorganisms can do. We'll also cover how humans have taken advantage of this metabolism to make foods.